Since my first shout out from the stage failed, I'm, I'm gonna put this one right at the top of this. Is, is, uh, is Adam Johnson from KDA here? Two strikes. Um, I used, we're expecting Adam Johnson and, and Eric Gregory here today, but uh, I used, and I wanted to uh, give them a shout out because I used to say that uh, ADI, ADI was the oldest and largest trade organization uh, representing craft distillers. Well, I found out I'm wrong. I found out several years ago that um, the Kentucky Distillers Association is the oldest trade organization representing um, distillers, and uh, they're one of several groups that worked very hard to um, get you the FET tax reduction that uh, I'm, I'm assuming you all enjoy right now. Are you all enjoying your tax break? <laughs> there are a lot of people individually and organizations that worked very hard to see that the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act of 2017 was passed. We are in Oregon, the state of Senator Ron Wyden, who wrote the bill. And uh, I'm imagining, uh, okay, maybe this is my third strike. Is Justin Stiefel out there? Uh, Justin Stiefel of Heritage Distilling is someone that really kept us well informed about the lobbying effort and, and what should happen and how our distillers should respond. But absolutely um, key to this effort was one organization that uh, is based in Washington, D.C., and it is the Distilled Spirits Council. And we're very lucky today to have with us the CEO and president of the Distilled Spirits Council. And now I'm at a loss. Craig, how do you pronounce your last name? I always say Nash. It's N-A-A-S-Z. But here is Craig Nash, the president and CEO of the Distilled Spirits Council. Drew, thank you uh, for that introduction. Um, my family says Nas, uh, but you know, coming from the Northwest, you have to use a little nasal when you pronounce it in order for it to be right. Bill, thank you uh, for inviting me here today and uh, for the great partnership that we enjoy with uh, you and your organization. Uh, so while we're waiting for the screens to come up, which I'm hoping that'll be in a moment here, um, it is a treat to be back in the Northwest. I grew up in Yakima, Washington, and um, have been associated with this industry in one way or another um, since the early part of my career. I had the uh, great fortune when I was a student at Washington State University of working with a gentleman uh, by the name of Burt Grant, whom some of you may remember, Grant's Ale, who, um, really the founder of the craft brewing industry in this, uh, in this country, and then got to spend 10 years on Capitol Hill uh, working for a variety of members, uh, both the House and Senate, and uh, that was at the time, frankly, when uh, both the craft brewing and wine industry in the Northwest was really uh, getting its foothold, um, and so it's a real treat for me um, to now come full circle and be in a position to be a part of this industry, um, which of course is experiencing um, unparalleled growth, um, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, what I'd like to do if we get the screen up is to give you a brief overview of the economic status of our industry and then talk a little bit about some of the issues both at the federal and uh, state level, um, both the achievements that we've had recently and some of the challenges that still remain. And uh, time permitting, um, I'd like to share some information with you about one issue in particular, uh, which is um, uh, efforts to reduce uh, the BAC level from 0.08 to 0.05 and its implications for all of us in this room. Um, so I mentioned that the spirits sector is uh, enjoying unparalleled growth. Um, is it? Good. We just don't have, we'll let them get it fired up here. We, uh, we did um, celebrate um, record sales uh, this past year, and for the eighth consecutive year, there we go. And then I don't know if you got the 
the monitor in front, but that would be helpful if it can be fired up. Um, we had record sales. Revenue uh, grew by 4%. And uh, our volume was up by 2%, which, which I'll speak to in a moment, but that really underscores the continued premiumization um, and consumers' fascination with the higher end uh, products in our marketplace. Uh, we also saw um, an increase of 14.3% uh, in exports, and I know many of you are involved in the export arena. Um, and this is being driven by the cocktail culture overseas and a fascination with American whiskey. In fact, U.S. export sales hit a new record in 2017, totaling some $1.64 billion. So here's, you can see the trend line, and as you'll note, um, our sales total supplier revenue totaled $26.2 billion this past year, which is a gain of $1 billion over 2016. Now, most of that growth, as I just mentioned a moment ago, came from the high-end and super premium categories, which is really continuing to fuel um, our prospects moving forward. Today, high-end and super premium now account for 65% of all supplier revenues as the trend on premiumization continues. Now, some of the key factors, which I suspect you're all aware of, they're helping to drive the enthusiasm uh, for distilled spirits are the, when consumer confidence in the economy is strong, we do better. Um, and at this point, consumer confidence remains strong. We're seeing um, a real um, fascination with our products among millennials who um, really enjoy the unique experiences that they derive from uh, interfacing with uh, our industry and its brands. And importantly, the continued growth of craft distilling um, and companies like yours are helping to drive enthusiasm for the overall spirits category. Now, as I mentioned just a moment ago, export sales hit a new record of $1.64 billion, which is an increase of 15% over the preceding year. Now, the Council, uh, through our participation in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Market Access Promotion Program, has contributed uh, to this record growth. Since 2006, we have conducted promotions in 20 countries around the world. And I know that uh, several of you have participated in these events, which provide a forum for you to meet uh, customers overseas and provide you with a global stage to expand your sales. Just out of curiosity, um, for those of you who are aware, how, how many of you in this room have taken part in a MAP or MAP-related program? All right, so we wanna, if you haven't, find somebody that a hand came up for because you'll find what tremendous value um, that holds for uh, the potential growth uh, for your company moving forward. Now, as, uh, as we just discussed a moment ago, and I suspect is going to be an ongoing theme of this conference, our most significant accomplishment this past year came in the waiting days of 2017, when Congress did approve a two-year version of the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act as part of the federal tax reform package. Now, this landmark legislation not only ushered in the first FET reduction since the Civil War, but importantly, it equalized the FET rate for beer, wine, and spirits on the first 100,000 proof gallons. And it's expected to yield more than a billion dollars in savings for distillers during its two-year span. Again, I want to thank Bill, Owens, and ADI for all of the grassroots support you provided to help us get this across the finish line. And I'd ask that all of you join me in recognizing their efforts in that regard. Now, these savings will enable distillers of all sizes, small, um, medium, and large, to invest back in their businesses and communities, generate jobs, supporting local agriculture, and boosting tourism. Um, We've undertaken an effort of trying to chronicle how distillers are saying they're making use of these savings. And one Florida distiller said she'll be hiring three additional employees. Another says he'll put the money toward the purchase of new equipment. And an Indiana distiller uh, plans to build a new visitor center to showcase his farm to glass 
operation. I would encourage everyone attending this conference to talk often, publicly, and positively about how your company plans to make use of these savings. If we want these tax cuts extended, it's going to take an effort on the part of everyone in this room to get that done. And to that end, I'd like to extend a personal invitation to all of you to join us this May at the Distilled Spirits Council's annual public policy conference in Washington, D.C. As you know, the FET is scheduled to expire at the end of 2019 unless it's either extended or made permanent. So we need you. We need you to join us in walking the halls of Congress, in talking with your members about how this tax is helping you grow or sustain your business and how it will benefit jobs and the economy in your local communities. Now, while that was our biggest accomplishment of the year and one of which we're all very proud, there were several others that I'd just like to briefly discuss with you. Um, we talked just a moment ago about the demonization of liquor and the continued blue laws and prohibition area obstacles that we continue to face. Well, because of a lot of work that's been done over the years, we're successful this past year in striking down prohibition era Sunday sales bans in the states of Minnesota and Oklahoma and providing consumers with greater convenience on the second busiest shopping day of the week. We saved suppliers $321 million by defeating serious tax threats in 18 states across the country. We heralded the National Football League's decision to finally allow television commercials for distilled spirits, marking the last major professional sports league to lift its ban on spirits advertising and leveling the playing field for our industry with beer and wine. And in Boston, the home of my Vice President of State Government Affairs, David Wonar, we were successful in reversing a five-year-old ban on alcohol ads on its mass transit system, which marked both a, not only a win for the spirit sector, but for the First Amendment as well. And lastly, we won 24 of 27 wet-dry elections in Texas, expanding consumer access to spirits for thousands of adults in the Lone Star State. Now, we are still, at this point, heavily engaged at the state level. On the state front, we have 35 legislatures that are currently in session, and of the more than 1,900 alcohol-related bills that have been introduced, we consider 1,000 of those to be of primary interest to our industry. We have faced 16 serious tax threats to date and have already beaten back proposals in Alaska, Indiana, South Dakota, West Virginia, and Wyoming. And in Indiana, in a major achievement that was a decade in the works, we were successful in securing approval for Sunday sales, which was signed into law on February 28th and went into effect the very following Sunday. To hear more about the efforts that are underway across the country, I'd like to invite all of you to join my colleague, David Wonar, at this afternoon's session where he'll have an opportunity not only to tell you about some of the things we have happening, but to solicit your input and feedback and, and support of our efforts across the way. David, if you just stand and be recognized so they all know who you are. This is David. Now, as I mentioned, just the one issue I wanna focus on in particular of the many that uh, are currently on our docket, um, we're seeing, a, a, again, a renewed interest on the part of anti-alcohol advocates to try to lower the BAC from 0.08, which is the current national standard, to 0.05. Just a, a month or so ago, we saw the National Academy of Sciences release uh, a new report calling for the establishment of 0.05 nationwide. They also uh, advocated raising taxes on alcohol limiting advertising, and restricting the number of retail outlets. Now, leading up to this report's release, we expressed our concerns uh, to the administration about the report's uh, singular focus on alcohol-impaired driving while ignoring the increasing problem of drugged driving. 
The National Highway Trafi Traffic Safety Administration uh, Deputy Administrator Heidi King, with whom I met recently, thankfully agreed with our point of view and indicated uh, in her words that we need to consider both drugs and alcohol to solve the problem of impaired driving, which led her to convene a drugged driving summit just this past March 15th. In order for us to understand how voters perceive this issue and to aid us in effectively delivering our message, uh, we undertook a nationwide survey um, representative of the nation's voter public as a whole to understand how they view the back limit. And I'd just like to take a moment to share some of those results, results with you. So a key finding of our survey found that there is broad support when you just ask the basic question for lowering the back limit. But that support, as you can see here, drops off dramatically when asked about lowering it from its current standard of 0.08 to 0.05, which just on its surface, most voters see as too uh, draconian of a shift in the current limit. The implications for us, and the reason I bring this to your attention, is that more than half of the respondents indicated that they would be concerned about having a drink with dinner if the back in their state were lowered to 0.05. Many indicated that lowering the back would lead to a change in their behavior, with 46% saying they would drink it at home instead of going out, and 23% saying they wouldn't drink away from home at all. So for those of you with on-premise locations or those of you who are, um, have made inroads supplying your local restaurants and the like with your products, this is of considerable concern to all of us. When it comes to credible sources on this topic, voters indicated that they view Mothers Against Drunk Driving, police and firefighters as the most trusted sources for information on BAC. But of concern, the hospitality industry, of which we're all a part, ranked at the bottom, which presents a challenge for us in terms of bolstering our credibility and providing us with a voice in this debate. In terms of messaging, what we found to be the most effective is that MAD supports leaving the back at 0.08, and that any new laws in the arena of drunk driving should focus on penalizing hardcore drunk drivers rather than moderate consumers. Among the key takeaways was, again, that we found there's general support for reducing the back, but that fades away when we talk about going down to 0.05. That we should focus our energy on helping voters and policymakers to understand that lowering it to 0.05 won't do anything really to affect the overall challenge, that we should be focusing our energy and attention on extreme drunk drivers and repeat offenders. And that when it comes to advocating against this policy shift, we need to be partnering onward with MAD, the police, prosecuting attorneys, and firefighters. And importantly, as our research showed, that while our messages can be effective, the other side's messages are equally effective. So we have to continue to pound this drum and keep this campaign ongoing in a substantive way if we're gonna be successful as this debate goes. There are proposals just north of us in Washington, south of us in California, out in Vermont, and, and again, Utah became the first state to go to 0.05. So we do have our work cut out for us in this arena. I'd like to close just by giving you a glimpse of our newly released uh, logo and website, which uh, we premiered last week. Um, this is part of a uh, ongoing broader modernization initiative that the Distilled Spirits Council has undertaken. You know, as we approach the 100 year anniversary of the repeal of prohibition, um, we at the council and our members have embarked on a forward-looking Vision 2033 initiative, which is designed to identify the over-horizon issues 
of importance to consumers that will help shape the future of the distilled spirits sector so that we can effectively position ourselves for our industry's ongoing success. I look forward to partnering with all of you as we continue to develop those principles and objectives going forward, and particularly, Bill, with your membership at ADI. So again, thank you for having me here. I look forward to visiting with some of you offline. It's a real treat to be here, and I thank you. Thank you.